obviously a lot of people made the smart choice. <laughs> I'm not referring to you guys. Um, hi everyone. We're good. My name is uh, Ian Amit, Ian, and I'm going to talk about cyber today. Love the word cyber. Uh, cyber crime, cyber war. Um, I'm going to mention it a lot, so if you're allergic to the terminology, please excuse me. Uh, if you have a better uh, alternative, I'll be more than glad to, to replace the, those worn out words. Um, I do have a day job, and this does not blah 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 blah. Um, if, if you really care about uh, this presentation and, and have a lot of opinions about it, uh, if they're good, hire us. If they're bad, I've got nothing to do with. Uh, they've got nothing to do with, with our, what I do. That's basically it. Um, so, what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk about cyber war, and to be able to talk about cyber war, we're going to put some terminology in place and uh, uh, talk about attack and defense. We're going to do the same for cyber crime, and then we'll get to the meat, which is connecting the dots. And this entire talk is just about connecting the dots. Uh, it's about realizing what kind of interactions and, and relationships exist between criminals, black hats, and I've got to say the ones that I've seen are a little better than the <laughs> example we've seen before, and, and governments basically, nation, states, whatever you want to call them. Um, we're going to take a quick look at the future and see how screwed we are and how we can try to fix it. And that's basically it. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to call bullshit on anything that I say, please feel free. Uh, I know that for a fact that some of this is probably not true. So, <laughs> probably. So who am I? Um, what makes me like stand here and talk to you guys and, and have your attention. Um, I'm a computer science, uh, I have a computer science degree. I'm a hacker. Um, I'm a researcher. I used to manage research for a few security companies in the past, uh, focusing on web security and, and malware. Um, I used to be on the other side as well, uh, which means development. Um, I wasn't that good at it. And it kind of bored me, so I switched back to breaking stuff, which is better. And in my spare time, I do some reserve duty at, uh, at the Israeli Air Force, um, and that's about it. Fun, huh? Um, this is not. This is one of my favorite things here. What's that? It's me belt, Turkish. Oh, Tom, it is a gun in your trousers. What is a gun doing in your trousers? For protection. Protection from what? From the Germans. Yeah. This is what I'm trying to avoid from the most. And please, 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 this is like a very intimate setting. If you see or hear me or whatever, talk bullshit, just call it out. Please, I beg you, I give you permission to, to shout the panties and just stop me. I'll be, again, more than happy. And this presentation has been through a lot and got some more data removed. I got some data removed, some data fixed because of great people that actually put me in place. So don't be afraid. I'm not going to bite unless you really want me to. Um, how did I get into this whole mess of saying cyber so much? Well, the story is very simple. I basically started some research doing very technical stuff. In forensics and, and looking into malware and, and trying to find it, blah, 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 all the, all the good stories. And at some point of time, uh, last year, uh, during some, some research, research, I started looking into the motives, into why are black hats doing black hat things. And I started researching kind of the economy of cyber crime who's connected to who, and, and how does malware got, get authored, distributed, marketed, managed, processed, all the, the business model of, uh, of cybercrime. And at one point of time, we, started, we found a big stash of data, a criminal server that we managed to get a glance into and really expose what's going on in the back, in the back end. And we started seeing some stuff that didn't make sense on the business level, on the business level of cybercrime. 
which means that stuff that, that you can't really sell on the market, like this. Oh, I hate those pictures. Um, this, this is a, a, a screenshot that I took from a PowerPoint presentation found on the kernel server. That screenshot depicts a satellite uh, photo, uh, probably using Google Maps or whatever it is, uh, with 12 digit uh, uh, GPS locations of targets. Along with a slide that depicts the timeline for a training drill test something using uh, cool tools like uh, F-16s and uh, ground to ground whatever engagements um, which again it, it's, it's kind of funky because it's, it's not sellable on the open market um, and obviously it's PowerPoint so it's being presented to management or whoever it is so there are conclusions and pretty graphs of how accurate were the bomb runs with like you know, the spread and this and that, and this is target one, this is target two. <clears throat> and the long side, I mean, this is bad enough, and, and it kind of spurred my attention to, well, what do I do with this? And as if it wasn't bad enough, we also found this, which was probably the reason for the whole PowerPoint. And this is a screenshot, again, from the software that was found on the criminal server that was stolen from someone else's server, um, which is a software that controls air scenario or air something. Um, you probably can't really see this, but this is like the description of the highlighted item, which is an F-16D. Uh, you've got some more F-16s around here. There's an A-64. Anyone knows what that is? It's an Apache. <laughs> Uh, there's a log here of events by time uh, of when a, a weapon was launched, when it hit, what's the accuracy, blah, blah, blah. blah. So, very, very interesting uh, information. Finally, declassified, uh, which was a big fight because I was trying to explain to the authorities that this was in public. I mean, if I can get to the server, anyone can get to the server. I mean, <laughs> seriously. Um, so, and, and everyone was kind of denying that it existed, it happened, and it's like, oh, this is dead or alive, or... And so, I can show this now without like flipping through this really quickly and asking for a video to like erase everything. Um, and that kind of stuck as a sore thumb in last year's research because I couldn't, couldn't really do anything with it and it didn't fit my slides. And so I just kind of put it in the end and said, oh, by the way, we also found this and kind of walked off the stage. Um, but it didn't really end there because I was looking into uh, what was going on and one of the uh, conclusions from last year was let's try to low jack uh, the data and track it and see where it ends up. Um, and surprising, I, I was surprised by myself that I actually did what I recommended. <laughs> um, and we found that data again. Um, and it, we didn't find it in, in like the usual places. It wasn't traded in the uh, usual crime or a market, uh, or cyber crime market. It got to a different state, a different uh, company that was you know, involved in making all sorts of software like this. So, uh, that was just the appetizer. Let's talk about cyber crime and cyber war. Okay, first question, and uh, this is going to be interactive, I hope. What is this? Yeah. Okay. Bullet hole. All right. What can you tell me about the bullet hole? You can't. You can tell me that it's a bullet hole, that it hits some metal, but you don't have the context. And this is what I felt that I was doing for a very, very long time. And from a forensic point of view, from a consultant point of view, from a research point of view, we've been focusing on the bullet holes, all right? On the little dents that uh, were left in our organizations or the organizations we're working for, but we couldn't put the bullet holes in context. And this is exactly what this talk tries to do. And we're going to try and see if the bullet hole is part of a war fair event or a criminal event, all right? Is this like a drive-by, gangbang, whatever, or part of a war? 
Um, and to talk about, again, crime and war um, is pretty easy. They're not that different. There's a little difference in financing, there's a little, little difference in, in backing, um, but there are a lot of resources available to both. And funnily, they actually share some resources <laughs> once in a while uh, because of, of the expertise needed uh, for both markets. So let's start with cyber war. This is the Wikipedia definition, which I'm going to bash in about seven minutes. And the definition states that cyber warfare is the use of computers and the internet and the internet in conducting warfare in cyberspace. And it's missing a big thing. Again, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Some people say that there's no cyber war. Uh, some people that I you know, really respect, but uh, I love the picture. <laughs> um, and this is not responsible for like, cyber or whatever. I mean, you get the job and then they say there's no need for me. <laughs> really, a career move. Um, and they usually pretext this with, well, it didn't really happen, and, uh, or there is no cyber war except. And then they start you know, going through you know, different events, Estonia, Georgia, Titan Rain, India, Google, Adobe, uh, whatever it is. So there's always some kind of a, uh, except for. Um, my view is that they've just not been connecting the dots. Okay? If you connect the dots, you can see what's going on. Uh, if you pull back from your focus on the bullet hole, you might be able to see what's going on. Uh, cyber war is not just nation versus nation, all right? It's not just Pentagon, uh, Pentagon versus uh, Kremlin. Uh, it's neither, you know, just spy versus spy, covert channels, uh, spooks and suits, and, uh, and so on and so, so forth. But it always, just like any other war, will yield some kind of civilian casualties or, or civilian uh, resources that are going to be at stake. It's war, all right? Um, it's, it's a bomb out something. I found. <laughs> Some you know residential building that got smashed. Yeah. Bombs have a, a, a side effect. <laughs> so I've been told. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like an implosion. Too. Um, these are the. Uh, this is still from Kathy with the permission. Um, this is from their 2009 uh, virtual criminology report. I love their um, their titles, and this is titled "Countries Developing Advanced Offensive Cyber Capabilities." Uh, you see the usual suspects: uh, the U.S. and Russia, China, of course. Um, there's France here for some reason. Uh, I'm not dissing France, but it's just you know I haven't seen a lot of cyber warfare capabilities. But again, this is just my view. I, I pretexted that, uh, and a little country here. Uh, um, <laughs> I didn't put it there. I can't put it there. All right. Um, in this context, and this context only, size does not matter. <laughs> this, <laughs> these are the countries that I'm going to focus on in this talk. Um, it's again usual suspects: US, Russia, China. Uh, I'm going to throw into the mix Iran because uh, I didn't run, and, uh, and there are in the mix, and there have been a lot of uh, things going on there. And the little green dot in the Middle East. Right? So let's start again with the usual suspects. The U.S. It's it's fairly well documented what's going on there. I just finished reading the report from uh, um, the the cyber drill number two or something like that. I can't remember. It's back in the apartment. Um, so so there's a lot of documentation. You see again the usual names that uh, we we always see NSA. Uh, the, the Stratcom, and the aggregation of all the three different, uh, four different uh, uh, cyber commands in the, in the military, Navy, and <coughs> so on and so forth. Uh, and other three letter acronyms. This is my favorite one, not because of what they do, but because of the logo and the name. It's called CAT, and they have like a vicious cat there. It's the FBI Cyber Action Team. And they must have run out of, of acronyms. So, um, Russia. Again, this is just a kind of a quick overview of, of the nations. Uh, in Russia, we have the GRU, which is the main intelligence directorate of the Russian.
Russian Armed Forces. Uh, we have the SVR um, that used to be called uh, uh, no, it's not the one. Um, for, for intelligence, we have the FSB that used to be the KGB uh, for federal security services inside. Uh, again, they're, they're kind of, you know, th there's a whole jurisdiction thing outside, inside. Everyone thinks they own the world, so it's, it's they do all of it, they, they deal with all of the place. One of my favorite, and they have the coolest logos ever, by the way. This is just me. And, and the coolest institute that I found there is just called plainly, Center for Research of Military Strength of Foreign Countries. I mean, why beat around the book? Just this is what we do. <laughs> um, last but not least, they have several uh, youth uh, national youth associations. Uh, they're called NASHI in, in Russia. Um, and they're very interesting because they're co highly connected to the political party. Mm -hmm. They are. Um, and they're kind of it's like Boy Scouts for advanced. Uh, very interesting, very motivated, uh, and uh, highly targeted. China, again, surprisingly enough, very, very well documented. Um, everything falls under the PLA, the Army. Um, I'm not going to bore you with more details because you can read this yourself. It's open and material. Northrop Grumman uh, had a great report on how the Army works, what, what they do with, uh, with the cyber. Um, the, the GSD 4th Department and the 3rd Department, Office and Defense, and yes, Titan Rain happened, and again, well documented, and I'm not going to be, you know, not going to bring any surprises to the table here. Iran. Uh, Iran is interesting because it's, it's much less documented, and it's a little easier to track because, again, everything falls under one organization. Uh, one particular interesting uh, fact is that they have the telecommunications infrastructure company, the only telecommunications infrastructure company that you know can call itself a telecommunications infrastructure company, um, which is a monopoly there controlled by the government and, and basically reporting and working very closely with the uh, armed forces, with the army. Now, if you look at this is, a, I took this camera for work, but uh, this is the wired uh, uh, connectivity in Iran over the years. And this is fiber optic cables running uh, in, in thousands. Look what happened since 2005, thick, six, right? They basically doubled their internet connectivity, and now it's just massive. And everything is controlled by this company, which is reporting to the army. Okay, uh, so very very tight uh, control over egress and egress, egress and egress. This is going to be a very boring slide because I can't tell you a lot about what's going on there. Um, there is a fair amount of documentation. You can you know you can Google it. Uh, we have the IDF, uh, which is the, the Israeli Army and the Defense Forces, um, which is knowingly and publicly developing cyber capabilities. <coughs> And both in the Air Force, in the Army, and in the intelligence community. And we have C4Is, just like any other Army, and which stands for Command Control Communication, and Computers, and Intelligence. And it's a small branch in each, each of the cores that, that's responsible for cyber, basically. And staffing, and again, for, for those of you who don't know, is most of all grown. Everyone in Israel is, is obliged to serve three years in the army and once you're 18. So you can't really recruit, you know, hackers with tenures of experience unless they start at the eight. Um, but because of that, there's a lot of training going on inside uh, the army. A lot of resources put into uh, qualifying those soldiers and making them uh, hackers. Um, another agency that there's in Israel uh, is the Mossad, obviously. <coughs> uh, again, the, the, they became very, very open in the last few years. They have a website, you can go to it, you can look for jobs, and buy the job section, which is what I usually do for every company I start working with. You can figure out what they do, all right, or what they're planning to do. So take a look there, use Google Translate, it, I, it's eye opening, it's frightening sometimes. All right, so let's talk about cyber war. 
an attack in cyber war um, for me is, is always a highly selective targeting of military and critical resources in conjunction with a kinetic attack. It's a war. Okay? This is the bashing of the Wikipedia definition, which I think is lacking that kinetic portion. Okay, cyber war will usually not just stand by itself. It can be a very small kinetic action, but there's got to be a kinetic action. Again, in my in my book, or a massive denial of service. All right. Uh, so we're moving from very selective, very targeted to just blanking out a telco. Okay, and and we're going to look at the examples. Uh, that's usually used to disrupt, to assist ground forces, uh, or to spread or to prevent propaganda. All right, change public opinion or affect public opinion. In terms of defense, it's never always military. Okay, uh, defenses are always going to include, as we uh, as we saw that there are always civilian uh, in, at stake. They're always going to include critical infrastructure, telecommunications, power, electricity, um, and sometimes defensively you would choose to shut down things just to prevent them from being blown up, uh, or you would choose to shut down access to systems just to keep them running. Uh, in light of a denial of service attack or, or some very, very high load uh, that the system's being uh, uh, exposed to. So, do you, yeah. do you see cyber espionage and counter espionage as another entity outside of cyber war? It's, uh, I see it as part of cyber war. And it's, Is it's, that like the same component? Yeah. Yeah. For me, again, for me, it's part of, of you know, prepared for war. Uh, I don't think that war can be defined in, all right, we start now, <laughs> all right, and we end now, that's it. There's not a kinetic component in intelligence gathering operations, but I would, I agree that I think they go together. I, I agree that there's not a lot of kinetic components, and when I'm saying kinetic, it's not just blowing stuff up. It's, it's getting people, you know, uh, a physical talking, yeah, a physical interaction. Um, so you need to psyops, I do what, sorry? You need to do psyops, psychos, human, 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 Everything is, is part of this big definition that's called war. Okay? Um, cybercrime. This sums up cybercrime from, from my perspective. If you don't see this when you talk about cybercrime, you're doing it wrong. You're missing the point. All right? Criminals don't do just this you know, for fun. And they don't do this for shits and giggles. They do this for the money. Uh, if you can't see the money, if you can't track the money, it's not it's not cybercrime. It's just you know pranks. Um, this is how the business works. It works again as a business. There's a CEO, there's the boss. Uh, there are like VPs, under bosses, and there are campaign managers that take care of spreading or, or managing specific campaigns. It's very very targeted. Uh, it will look into geographies, uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, niches of market, languages. Very selective, very efficient, uh, and just works again like a business. From the attack side, we we've all seen this before. Uh, we know the, the the usual suspect, the Trojans, the uh, um, the crime word, the malware coming through mail, web, open services. Um, I'm not going to you know bring any anything new to, to this. Uh, but <coughs> on, on the global scale, in terms of geography, this is what it looks like when you're talking about cybercrime. Again, remember the first slide about cybercrime? The big pile of money? Guess where the money is? Okay? And this image was uh, created after tracking a criminal, again, that criminal, the big criminal server in 2009. And what we did here was to map out all the uh, websites that were compromised and include the malware. Uh, and we, again, this is a generalization, you can't really pinpoint a website, uh, but this is where the websites belong to. This is where the criminals were targeting their attacks on to get money. So again, east and west uh, of the US, there's no money here for some reason, <laughs> uh, or no servers or websites. 
Excuse me? <laughs> That's my web server there. It's <laughs> cheap hosting. Um, <laughs> Western Europe, okay, and some, some parts of, of uh, China and, uh, and Japan. Again, looking for the money, looking for your targets in the locations that you're, uh, you're bound to find them. This is how it looks like in terms of the actual, actual groups running the campaign. All right, the groups actually are located, uh, again, in those areas because they need to be specialized. They need to know the language, the culture, uh, the news, all right, what's going on. We'll see a lot of, uh, just open the news any day of, of the year. Whatever's hot is going to be uh, uh, used to spread malware, all right? It's easy. If you Google, I don't know, what, Paris Hilton got whatever today, uh, because she, does, she did, criminals will use that and either set up new websites that contain those keywords to attract uh, uh, innocent customers to, or infect existing uh, websites uh, because they're, they're dragging a lot of uh, attention. In terms of tools, um, the ammo, again, the usual suspects. This is a screenshot of one of my favorite, <laughs> you can call it, uh, tools used in, in the kernel world, and it's Zeus. Okay, I think we've seen some, uh, some examples before, but this is what, uh, what the tool looks like when you actually try to use it. You get a boot, all right, you configure it. You're not really required to hack anything. You're not even required to know, you know, computer science or, or stuff like that. You just need to know how to use a GUI and tell it what to do. And each time you click this little button, you'll get a new binary. And each click of that button will generate a version with detection rates ranging from 30% to maybe 50%. And if, if it's, it really screws up in terms of AV detection for like 40 something AVs. And so this, this is pretty efficient. If you click enough times or buy like a, a, a better version, the detection rates go down to like the, the single digit. <laughs> this is what it looks like. And this is the, the other side of the tool. And this is again the, the, the command control center. All you have to do is to, you download this little package, you run it on your web server, configure it. It's very basic. It's got an installer. And it configures the database and everything needed. And you can just control your army of bots. Okay? Very efficient. And again, very easy to use. It's just all click and, and run. Defense. This is going to be very short. Anti something. Virus, malware, Trojan, Spyro, whatever it is, we've seen the detection rates, okay? Um, and then you must say, all right, there's firewalls, IDSs, IPSs. Seriously? Uh, we all know how that works. <laughs> okay? It's just not. And just equipped it. Blind, completely blind. All right, case closed, defenses are done. So how do we connect these? Is that exactly 30 minutes to connect them? Um, my claim is that cyber crime is being used to conduct cyber war. And I might even rephrase it or, you know, to say abused or is working with state nations to launch cyber war. Uh, to prove my claim, we, can, we need to take a little scroll down history lane and see how past events have, have happened. I had to put this, all right, because it happened. I don't really like it because there's not, there wasn't a lot of a, a kinetic kind of effect in the Estonia war, cyber war. And, and again, read all about it. I'm not going to bore you with you know details that other researchers made huge names on. Just focusing on this. Um, bottom line is that civilian infrastructure in Estonia, uh, which is a small state. <laughs> running on the internet, apparently, <laughs> uh, was attacked from civilian networks. Okay. You would expect the attack to come from, I don't know, kremlin.gov.ru, but it didn't. <laughs> For some reason, it ran from a lot of civilian networks, uh, home DSLs, companies, hosting services from Russia. Israel. Okay. Um, 
Israel actually participated or was involved in some shape or form in what we define together as cyber warfare. A couple of examples, um, my favorite one, Operation Orchard. Anyone heard about it? Oh, <laughs> um, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing. This, this is what happened in or Operation Orchard. This is from uh, the, the Spiegel. Why is that? Okay. Um, this is the before and after. Okay? This is a nuclear uh, facility uh, in Syria that this happened to it. Uh, something happened to it. Uh, on September. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm saying something happened to it because uh, there's a terminology being used a lot in Israel uh, that goes according to foreign sources. <laughs> So according to foreign sources, um, planes, aircrafts, F-16s, F-15s, uh, came into Syria one day, September 6th, my birthday, it's, it's a little present they, they gave me, and nuked the shit out of this facility. There was a lot of controversy around this, and because, I don't know if you know, but to get, you know, allegedly Israel did this, and to get from Israel to Syria to that specific location, you have to go obviously through Syria, but also through some parts of Turkey. The embarrassing thing about this whole operation, or church, which again I think is brilliant, is that no one could actually attest to the fact that they saw quite electronically any aircrafts crossing the border or coming in and out or whatever. So unless we have some fact and technology that, you know, being outside, I'm on top of Syria clearly. Being down and gone, and there was some kind of involvement on the cyber front to make those airplanes disappear, which is hard. All right, but it's a big fucking plane, <laughs> and we don't have stealth fighters like the rich Americans, so <laughs> we have to make them stealthy. So th this is this is a prime example, I think, of again cyber warfare as I like to see it, and which is part of general war. Right, kinetic, cyber, making things happen, uh, synchronized, so on and so forth. Um, some more activities on, on the cyber front. Uh, there have been some, uh, a lot of collisions between uh, like local um, like stuff in, in Gaza and, and Lebanon. Uh, Cast led, second Lebanon war, uh, included some cyber <coughs> activities. Uh, this happened in Israel. All right, there was it was like a banner, an advertisement. Download our software and join the cyber like army, whatever, so that will attack like Arab, you know, news facilities and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of those attacks were attributed, obviously, to hacktivists. This this is not like government sponsored. <laughs> it's not like <laughs> gov.il and uh, and you'll see this. Uh, the same thing happened on the other side. A lot of hacktivism, <coughs> which is. Somewhat guided, somewhat misguided. Um, an interesting fact about uh, what's going on on, on the uh, uh, other side uh, is a forum or a group called AR Hack, uh, Arabic Hackers. Uh, it's a hacker forum by day and a cyber crime operation by night. So they're kind of hacktivists, you know, by day, fun and games, but there's another part of it which is just proper cyber crime. And uh, this is how it looks like. Um, this is the forum talking, you know, uh, kill all the infidels, blah, 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 and let's bomb their, you know, cellular networks and, and kill their internet, and uh, let's buy and sell cards for half their balance and the usual, you know, criminals operation stuff, uh, selling 1600 uh, uh, Visa cards. This is all in Arab, but you can translate it easily if you want the URLs, just let me know, or go to arhack or look for Arab hackers. And getting into the form is fairly easy. Again, use a lot of Google Translate, and it's great. Georgia. Dong is Israel. No questions. <laughs> um, Georgia. This is the most interesting uh, research that I think I've done and looked into. <clears throat> Again, it's interesting because it was very, very synchronized. Uh, and when I'm talking synchronized, again, it's kinetic and cyber. What happened there oh, sorry, uh, is that we saw, again, 
the attacks launch from civilian networks. Later, we'll connect them to very specific networks uh, that were targeting websites in, on the Georgian side. Uh, and they happened right on time with the actual troop movements from Russia to Georgia. Uh, so they were kind of blanking out specific website news outlets so the news wouldn't come out in Georgia as the troops first over. Uh, so and it really helped. It, it was kind of a proof of concept for, for Russia to test their uh, relationships with whoever uh, ran those attacks, and it, it kind of proved correct. To understand how the Russian side works, uh, we'll have to take a quick look at those names. Uh, it must ring a bell to, you know, to some of those must ring a bell to some of you. Uh, Micronet, Nicolo, Atrevo, uh, RBN, ST Domains, they're all Russian outlets uh, or hacker outlets, uh, criminal, that are uh, running criminal operations. Okay, cyberpunk. Um, this is how it looks like in terms of some relationships. And I throw in the Russian government because uh, there are some interesting connections. Atrevo is a uh, hosted by UKR Telegroup and Hostfresh. Hostfresh is, is registered uh, in China, UKR Telegroup in uh, Ukraine. Atrivo is registered in Denver or California, I don't know where. Atrivo is a customer of EST Domains, which is a customer of the RBN. The RBN is Russian, uh, running from Russia itself and have very close political ties to the government. Um, the network provider for Hostfresh and UKR Telegroup is the RBN again. Uh, so you can see how that ties in. Uh, these are all criminal outlets, EST Domains, and Colo, that I can say they're criminal and not get sued because they actually <laughs> got sued themselves. <laughs> and, uh, and you probably know the McCullough story that was shut down, spam dropped like 70% and then grew back to its normal sizes in four weeks. Um, <coughs> the interesting fact is that RBN and Nicolo are connected to the Russian government. RBN is actually backed by the Russian government, which keeps it run. Why? Money. Okay? Um, and so the ties are, are too obvious to ignore uh, between crime and government in, in the Russian, uh, in the state of, nation of Russia. Uh, so how did that, that Russian-Georgia thing work? It started by picking on the president, like you always do, just, you know, nag the boss. Uh, uh, DDoS the president's uh, website, and then the command control servers that were running those botnets that attacked the, uh, the website were shut down, as troops crossed over the border, we had a few days of silence because, you know, ground stuff happening, shooting, whatever. And then six new command control servers came up that started attacking additional sites. Uh, on top of the president, the parliament, uh, some news organizations, basically targeting, again, uh, government and news sites to kind of, you know, help the war and shut things down. <coughs> Interestingly enough, those command and control servers, at the same time, were attacking other things. Multitasking. Multitasking, exactly. Uh, or, as we call it, you know, usual business, uh, which is attacking porn sites, card reforms, gambling sites, adult escort services, Nazi racist sites, web money, web gold, etc., etc., which is classic cyber crime, extortion. You know, if you run a successful enough site on the uh, gambling, Internet gambling th things, you'll get to know these guys, I promise you. Okay? It's called protection. Um, connecting the dots here is, is like trivial. Alright? I don't even have to be creative to you know, pull stuff out of my sleeve. Um, same command control servers running cyber war. Again, highly synchronized to the ground troops and running their usual business on the same IP address. Smart, maybe. And safe? Problem. It's a government. Iran. Another interesting uh, event. We all remember the 2009 Twitter. Ooh, Twitter's gone. I, can't, I don't have any friends. Blah, blah, blah. Um, the DNS attack was attributed to Iranian activity. Political connections are, are just too obvious to ignore. Okay? Uh, if you remember the timing, if you look back at the, like, the time machine, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, protests running inside Iran uh, opposing the government uh, alongside some UN, UN Council decisions to ban or extend the ban on, on trade 
when I ran or something, something like that. So it was just, it just happened to be on the right time. This is what Twitter looked like. For a chance, it wasn't boring. Um, on the day of the attack, uh, this is the, the defacements of the Iranian cyber army. The site has been hacked by Iranian cyber army. Uh, blah, 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 blah. There's a Gmail address if you want to contact us. Yeah. <laughs> For more, please contact Iranian cyber army at gmail.com. Yeah. The DNS. Yes. Yeah. Did they do that by hacking the DNS server? Or? No, they did that by, by hacking the, by using the, uh, stealing the passwords for the DNS administration uh, that was not run by Twitter, it was run by, by some third party company uh, where you can log in and say, oh, my you know, A record is not this anymore. And this is what it looked like when you Googled it. And this is Twitter. This site was, has been hacked by Iranian cyber army. Um, now, <clears throat> Iranian cyber army, surprisingly enough, is not something that you run to, into any day, right? Yeah. It's not something that you ran into before October, give or take, 2009. It just did not exist. Okay? What did exist was a group called ASEAN. Um, ASEAN is, is a group very similar to AR hack that we've seen before. Uh, it's a Shiite group from uh, Iran that's like a, they have a forum and hacking and, and stuff like that. And this, these are some of their defacements. Uh, if you take a closer look at you know, the HTML template, blah, 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 you'll see that it's very, very similar, if not the same, as the Iranian cyber army hacking, and this is kind of going back, to, uh, going back in history uh, of their defacement that they used. Right? That template was available and still is available at the ASEAN Group's forum sites uh, for use of the members that are doing whatever they do. Um, it's the same pro-Hezbollah messages that, uh, that, that Twitter attack had, um, and the Iranian cyber army is actually a group inside the forum of ASEAN. Okay? So it was set up specifically inside ASEAN to conduct this specific attack for some reason. Okay? Let's take a look at other operations from, uh, from ASEAN. Um, in the forums, again, it's, it's a fascinating forum. You should walk in and whatever. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a section called War Games. This is what they do <laughs> in war games. In war games, what you do is you set a target. The, the forum manager says, all right, war games today is on chestergas.com. Okay? Here are the rules of engagement. All right? This is what you need to do. Uh, uh, to win points, you need to take data uh, or get control over servers or do this or do that. And it's like the least points are for defacements and, and the usual stuff. And this is kind of, you know, a game, training, okay? This is training. ChesterGas.com is the website for the Chester County National Gas Authority in uh, South Carolina, I think. This is training, okay? And the targets are not, you know, randomly pulled. There are specific targets that they're looking for. This is national infrastructure. Okay, this is training in ASEAN. Uh, what else happened on the 18th? Anyone's birthday or? Huh? Anyone remember what happened December 18th? Something big, not just Twitter. Again, this is, Twitter is big enough by itself. Nothing. Yeah, I'm not making this up. Iranian troops crossed the border to Iraq, seized an oil well, and said, it's mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why didn't anyone hear about it? Because <laughs> Twitter was there. <laughs> Everyone was busy with, what's up with Twitter? <laughs> Give it the fail whale, anything. Just not this, you know, hacked website. Um, again, this is highly targeted, synchronized, not by coincidence. All right, we've seen the training, we've seen how they work. We know the MO. The MO, by the way, for a Twitter attack is very, very close to the MO of criminal attacks that we're seeing. 
okay, that are targeting companies. Uh, more recently, uh, the, the Baidu takedown, same MO, all right? Stealing credentials for the uh, DNS servers, taking down Baidu. There's a whole like thing going on between Iran and China for some reason, but um, apparently that's how they work things out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is kind of kind of a quick recap of how ASEAN or, or Iran operates in terms of cyber crime and cyber war. Uh, ASEAN is running the usual, you know, botnet, DDoS, you know, uh, site defacements, uh, credit cards and theft, and so on and so forth. Um, targeting U.S., U.K. money, uh, DDoS on Iran, and Iraq, apparently, uh, and ASEAN. And inside ASEAN is the Iranian cyber army that is a little more strategic in terms of its targets and, uh, and operations, targeting the U.S. and China. Okay, uh, the border between crime and war not really clear. All right, and we've seen the training, we've seen how they operate, and uh, we've seen the MO and connecting the dots is just trivial. Uh, I'm going to skip through China, if you'll excuse me, because it's been you know played over and over and over. Google, Adobe, 40 other companies got screwed in the whatever, and, and everyone's blaming China. China was saying it's a classic. China was just saying it's not me. Everyone's like ah, it's China. It wasn't me. And the the, the best part was uh, the. <laughs> they blame the U.S. Uh, and actually help track down the uh, some of the sources of that alleged sources of the attack back to U.S. to the U.S. I mean, the, the whole you know geo uh, geographic thing is, is all screwed up because of their, it's internet. Uh, and, and believe me, you can connect the dots. Hola, <laughs> we're insane. And there are actual uh, actually some Spanish like really good hackers, and a lot of activity is going on in the criminal as well as the uh, uh, cyber war thing front. Anyone know what this is in Spanish? Mariposa. Okay, blue butterfly or whatever, or a brand of butterfly. Uh, 12 million bots. Respectable for people who eat lunch for an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> Give them creds. Um, the software itself was written by a hacker or hacker group in Slovenia. All right, let's start the conspiracy theory. Uh, the outreach was global, which was way beyond uh, uh, what it was initially intended for, as, as I believe. Uh, and we've heard stories of you know projects that kind of blew out of scope and it's like, oh, I got. <laughs> shitloads of, of stuff that I don't need. And, and there's a lot of government involvement in terms of who got hit and who was involved in the uh, following investigations. And there's, for some reason, a lot of investment from different governments in getting the Mariposa guys. Uh, the bottom line is that three people were arrested uh, February 2010, a few months ago. Uh, I'm going to butcher the names, but uh, Net Cairo, uh, Johnny Lolente and uh, Austria, Austri Austriator, uh, the Spanish names are beyond my pronunciation, <laughs> uh, are part of the DDP, uh, Diaz de Pasadilla group, um, Days of, uh, what is it? Nightmare. Yeah, Nightmare, sorry. Um, Days of Nightmare, <clears throat> uh, they were arrested and, and taken down all that crap, but it did not end there. The investigation was actually going after the guy who wrote the software. First off, because I've actually heard about it, that someone is actually going for the software creator. Why? Remember Global Reach? Remember Slovenia? In July 2010, Slovenian police arrested their source, all right, Izerdo. Izerdo, uh, who sold the kit to hundreds of additional individuals and governments. I'm doing a really shitty job because I should have just quoted the website like the new source. There are multiple. It's for real. Okay? And the best attestment of what was going on, the FBI called the Slovenian operation excellent and unparalleled. Excuse my language, but what the fuck does the FBI have to do with tracking down the Slovenian creator and reseller of a botnet that was running from Spain? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. The, the story, the, the, the story is not uh, does does not have closure yet. There's still a lot of investigations going uh, going on tracking the the uh, Izardo, uh, which is if you flip it back in Slovenian, it's savior. <laughs> Um, as part of open intelligence intelligence cases, so I, I can't really give you the huge news of here's how everything ties together. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> give me a minute. Um, but this this is just what happened. Quick few words on the future. Uh, Oracle, Oracle, what do you see? What is this? Quickly, old PC. All right. What happens when you put one of these? Uh, unprotected, uh, no real like security protection, technically whatever it is, in a third world uh, nation, it gets infected. You get a pretty nice size botnet running from you know South Africa or West Africa, uh, all in your disposal and and free to roam. Um, the nukes, all right, of the future are not. There's no internet kill switch, right? No one is inventing like the, the old day that's going to kill us all. It's still connectivity. Are you saying we're going to bomb Africa? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's still internet connectivity. The bigger connectivity that you have, the more power you have, all right? In this case, size does matter. Right? This is the currency of the future. This is the currency that we need to deal with in terms of uh, um, crime as well as war. Right? This is, can be used to shut down a gambling site as well as a government. We've seen the good formal training on cybersecurity and, and in governments and in companies and, uh, and a lot of investment going into it. The bad news is that commercial development of malware is still king. And the ugly <laughs> is that these two connect. All right, you'll see a lot of governments, a lot of organizations, legitimate ones, buying and using software that was created on the uh, bad side uh, to their advantage, either to learn or to cut corners because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, what to do is fix this legislation. All right, there is still a notion of countries in the internet. Okay, forget it. Uh, all the work that's been done right now by law enforcement, especially in Europe, by the way, this is this is phenomenal uh, of connecting, you know, police forces and and breaking the barriers in terms of criminal investigations on the internet should be applied to uh, uh, the politics as well. All right, and what's better than using you know existing treaties that are being done on, on the nuclear side and just adapting them to the cyber war side? All right, it's the same thing. These are nukes, these are nukes. It, they're just behind, behaving differently. Okay? Any questions? Yeah? I've seen instances of national communications authorities. Of what, sorry? Of telcos, national telcos, concealing war, cyber warfare campaigns. Concealing? Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, I've seen her, it's fairly well documented. And again, Iran is not just a one up. I mean, the, the fact that the, the government or the military in Iran has a lot of control over the telco doesn't mean that in Western nations there is absolutely no connection. All right, there's always going to be some kind of synergy. Uh, there's always going to be like an insider guy that, you know, has the secret laptop or whatever. And, and yes, it's, it's, it's happening. Okay? Any more questions? We're like completely out of time. No? 